recording. All right, there we go. All right, first thing first, I do want to kind of remind everybody that I released the solution to one of the versions of the exam. I, I have one version for each student, so you guys all have your own you know, set of questions, but they're very similar, okay? They have the same type of questions and they have the same type of difficulty across all the questions as well. So if you're interested to know the answer or how to work on the answer, um, this is um, a zip file, it has two files in it. One file is the question and one file is the answer. And the answer is kind of detailed. You know, in other words, I kind of explain how to solve the problem. It's not just the final answer. So if you guys are interested you know, to know, you know what the approach should have been, I think this should help. Are there any specific questions about exam two that you want me to go, you want me to go over today? Yeah, from truth table. The truth table approach? Okay, I kind of thought that some people might ask that. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and take, oh, this is the wrong one. All I have to do is to change 310 to 440. Because I named the exams you know, in a very consistent way, so it's just a matter of which folder contains it. All right, so this is um, version 000, so one of you may actually get exactly this you know, test here. All right, so what do we do you know, with this, okay? And I do believe that in class, I specifically talked about, you know, how we can make um, a DNF to work, okay? So let me um, put up a text editor to the side. Okay, this one, yeah, this is the exact file that I sent you know, or include in the zip file, but I'm gonna make a new, uh, new version for this. Okay, so there are a few approaches. One is going to be a killer, even though it is possible to find the solution. The other one is a whole lot easier. So we will start with a, an observation. So we'll start with the observation of the ones first. So we look at this one here, and we go like, hmm, how do I make sure that I end up with a one only on this row when P is true, Q is true, and R is false? So that would be, that's one thing that I did cover in class. I remember I distinctly talk about it. So in this case, we have, you know, if P is true, Q is true, and we negate R, this expression is going to be true, but only for the second row, only for this row. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so for the same reason, I can also make another row true, which is real, because in this case, I only have two rows that are true to begin with. So I can also make this one true, and this one is gonna look like um, not P, not Q, and R. Is that okay? So these are the only two rows that need to be true. One, each one can make exactly one row true and everything else false. This one will also make just one of the rows true, but everything else false. So how do I make, how do I combine these two so that the two rows that are true in the truth table would end up to be true? How do I combine these two? Well, you only got two logical operators. We do an or, exactly. So we do an or. So now you have a starting point, right? So if you do an or here, you have a starting point. And in this particular case, this is not a bad starting point, actually, because if you do the FOIL thing, this FOILs really well. Okay, so let me show you what, what you know, how this is going to FOIL to. There will be nine entries in the FOIL. So you end up with P or not P, P or not Q, P or R, and then you have Q or not P, Q or not Q, uh, Q or R, and then finally, you have not R or not P, not R or not Q, and then finally, you have not R or R. So there are nine entries, it's kind of tedious, but you do end up with you know, these you know, kind of terms here. And now we can do simplification. So when I say simplification, when, whenever you see your P or not P, that's easy. What is it? It becomes true, just one, right? Okay. So that means you know, they basically just kind of go away. So let me do the simplification on the next row. I know you guys cannot do this, but you can, it's still not too bad just to kind of 
cross out items and say that the, those things are not really meaningful. So this is not meaningful because it's just true. Um, and then we have a, quite a few. You know, the last one, which is R or not R or R, can, can go away too. And then we have Q or not Q. That goes away as well. All right, so we are now left with uh, six terms, and some are duplicates. And I'm not good at uh, reading things when they are not alphabetically sorted. So let me just kind of resort things a little bit. Okay, um, QR. So there we go. And there's one more here that is in the wrong order. Yeah, I just yeah, it, it just doesn't doesn't work well with me when they're in the wrong order. Okay, so now we can look at this and then we ask, um, can we simplify a little bit here? What do you guys think? So you now okay. So what we do here is now we compare to uh, what we want to be the result. So the result set here, we want not P or not R. So not P or not R is here already. Okay, so that's good. We, we, we got this one covered. And then the next one is Q or R. So Q or R is also here. And then the last one is P or not Q. And P or not Q is over here as well. So now the question is, what do we do the rest? I mean, you know, what about this guy over here? What about um, there should be a f few other ones that we also, you know, do not really need? Okay, so let me regroup this first. Okay, so we'll regroup this to have all the things that we need to be in one place. And then all the things that we do not want to be some in another place. So we now have to say, what is the other one? P or R. Okay, P or R is one that we do not need. P or not Q is good. Not P or Q. Not P or Q is. We need to get rid of that. And then not Q or not R. We also want to get rid of. Okay. So how do we get rid of the, the terms that we do not actually want? So let me separate the two portions. One portion we want to keep. This is the portion that we want to keep. And then the other portion we don't want to keep. So the portion that we don't want to keep, um, we have to rely on some kind of simplification to get rid of these. Any ideas of how to do this? You can do resolution. So with resolution, um, OK, resolution, the implication only goes one way. So that means that whatever you add to it is not going to change the meaning. It does not mean that you can remove items that are already here. So the, what we can do to remove things is to say, okay, each, each, is any one of these terms implied by the other side? So as you said, it's resolution, but we are applying resolution in a special way. So is there any way for me to apply resolution to end up with P or R from the other three that we have? Okay, so we, we, we can take a quick look. So. P or R, so that means you know, we have to use Q as a connector. Um, yes, we indeed we can. Okay, so this one here, okay, can be implied by these two over here. So as a result, we can get rid of this one because whatever is implied in a conjunction, if you have multiple terms in a conjunction, if one term implies the other one, the one being implied can be removed. Is that okay or not? So that's how we can remove P or R because it is a result of resolving these two terms. And then when we look at these two, this one here, can we resolve the other three to get to this one? So we also need R in this case as a connector, but we need a Q on one side and we need a not P on the other side. 
So resolving the first two would end up with this term here, and because it can be the result of a resolution, it is not needed. I mean, it doesn't hurt anything to be here, but it's not needed either. And then the last one is uh, not Q or not R, which means we're going to use P as a connector. And so if we use P as a connector, it has to be, it can only be the first versus the last. So if we resolve the first with the last, okay, let me point out which first I'm talking about here. So if we resolve this one as the first one, and then we resolve it with this one as the last one of the origin of the three that we want to keep, we also end up with this term here. So this is how we can eliminate all three terms, and then we are only left with the ones that we want. Is that okay? Well, that's one way to do it. What is the other way to do it? The other way to do this is to start with CNF, and then we perform simplification to get to the format that we want. So do you guys want to see the other way too, or do you, are you guys, okay, all right, we can do that. So the other way to look at this, Okay, so let me just make a conclusion. Are there any questions about this approach? Does anyone want to see, you know, how I can prove that if you have, you have if you have a few terms, one is implied by another one, and they're all in a conjunction. The one that is implied is redundant. We don't need it. Is that okay, or do you want to see the proof? It's okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so the other way to do this is to look at the zeros. So we look at all the zeros, you know, under psi, and then we ask, hmm, how can I end up with only a zero here but a one everywhere else? So let's look at the first row, okay? So the first row, so we can think of it in a few ways. The way I think about this is kind of convoluted. So I would start with PQR. So PQR is a conjunction. That is true if and only if P, Q, and R are all true. So instead of a zero here, I end up with a one. So you go like, attack, isn't that opposite to exactly the opposite to what I want? The answer is, yep, that's exactly the opposite to what I want. So in order to make it what I really want, I can just negate it. Oh, put an exclamation point. I can do it like this, right? So. The, the negation of P and Q and R is going to result in a zero, is result in a fault, but only for the first row. It's going to be a one for all of the other rows. Does that make sense to you? Because P and Q and R will end up with a one only for the, for the first row, but it's going to be a zero for all of the other rows. So that means if I negate it, I just inverted everything. So it, we end up with a zero on the first row, but we end up with a one for all of the other rows. Is that okay? Intuitively speaking, it also makes sense because if you apply the Morgan's law, this becomes not P or not Q or not R, which means if any one of these three is a false, I end up with a true in the end. Okay, well, that kind of explains why we end up with a one for all of the other rows and only end up with a zero on the first row. So this approach can also be utilized to the other rows with a zero. So let's take a look at the third row. So the third row says, you know, if I use you know, P not Q R, I end up with a one only on that row. But if I negate it and then apply De Morgan's law, then I end up with not P or Q or not R. So the same way I can now, you know, work out the other, the other ones. This one has a lot of false rows, so it takes a little bit longer. So we have um, the negation of uh, P, not Q, not R. This becomes not P or Q or R. Okay, wait. Yep, that, that's right. Okay. And then the next one is this one. So basically, every time you see a one, that reminds you of an exclamation point. Okay, that's kind of the way to remember. Um, so this is the first three, so we have these three. So this is the next one. So we have non-negated, negated, and then negated. So we have P non-negated, Q negated, and R also negated. And then the next one is this one, which only has Q negated. So we have P or, whoops, P or not Q or R. And then we have the last one, 
where everything is not negated. So we have P or Q or R. Okay, so let me get all of these into one spot. All right, so first of all, is everybody okay with how I ended up with the six disjunctive terms? Each disjunctive term corresponds to a zero on the side column of the truth table. So now the question is, um, what am I going to do to end up with the format that I you know, want you guys to get to? All right, so let's do some simplification. And I'm just going to repeat all of these. Okay, just to save time, I know you guys cannot do this in during the exam, but in order to save some time in the class, I'm just going to copy and paste. So it does apply, you know, it, you kind of need to apply Boolean algebra to a certain extent to get to this and at least you know, explain the rationale behind, you know, how we ended up with these disjunct dis disjunct disjunctive terms. All right. All right, so now we have six of these things and we have to somehow simplify these six to the three that we want. So we look at the first one, which is not P or not R. So we look at all of these things that has not P or not R in it. This is the first one. And the second one is right next to it. Nice. Okay, so if you look at these two, you can, so these two can be re-expressed. You can use resolution, okay? You can apply the same resolution logic if you want to, but you can also just apply um, linear algebra because this becomes, um, Let me see. Oh, right. If, if we apply, so we are doing factoring. So once we do factoring, we get these two out, it becomes not Q and Q. Okay, the rest stay the same. I'm just going to copy and paste. There we go. Okay, so are we okay in this step here? It's the reverse of distribution. This is really just you're looking at not P or not R as one term. And then, you know, so looking at these as one term, and then this one has the extra thing of not Q, this one has the extra thing of Q. So once we do the factoring, then we end up with not Q, Q. Um, we can do the same trick with the other two. So we want Q or R. So we have to find um, the ones with Q and Q or R in it. This is one. And then the other one is at the end here. So just by repositioning this, okay, it just makes it a little bit easier to read. So we paste this one over here. Okay, so between these two, okay, look, let's let me highlight those two. Between these two, do you guys see how one has P and the other one has not P in it? but everything else are the same. So that means I can now also simplify this one. So it becomes not P, P as one term, and it's just ORed with the rest. So we can now get rid of that. Are we good so far? And then between the other two, we get rid of the R term. So like so. And I'll just put extra parentheses that are not really needed, but I want to emphasize that we did factoring in this step. So once we get here, we can also simplify. Because between the negation of Q and Q, one of them has to be false. And we need just one false for a conjunction to become false. So this term you know, simplifies to false or zero. Not P, P is also going to be zero. R, not R is also going to be a zero. So once we simplify those things out, if you want it to be really step by step, then we have not P, whoops, not P or not R or zero. Then we have zero or Q or R, and then we have P or not Q or zero. But anything or false is just the original anything. So once you know, we do that simplification, then we end up with the exact um, expression that we wanted to end up with. Is that okay? So that's how, so there are two ways, okay? So I just demonstrated two ways 
to start with the truth table, to end up with the expression that, that is given to you. I think if I did not give you the expression you know, in the end, I think it might actually be a little bit harder to do the simplification. If you use the second method, this is already a CNF. But to use this CNF later on to do the resolution might be actually a little bit cumbersome. Um, this is a little bit more simplified, but it's not as simplified as it can be. I think, um, how can I know it's not as simplified as, as it can be? Let me see. Maybe it is. For this one, it is. Nope. Never mind. So does that kind of explain uh, question number six? A little tricky? Curveballish? <laughs> but that's one out of seven questions. I hope it's not too bad. Yep? Is the truth table the same for all the exams? Or? They're not the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Hmm? What is the solution? Just and the last D and not D. So there are two possible answers for in that I have displayed here. Um, the first, this would be my preferred way to do it is to start with CNF, even though it's a little bit longer than what I need, because your combining you know, is a whole lot easier than you know, doing the foil. I just do not like to do the foil. But for people who feel really comfortable doing the foil, the other way is to kind of do it using the foil. But because in this case, foiling is not much worse. In fact, it might be slightly better. Um, because in this case, we only have two um, items in the DNF in the disjunctive normal form. So doing a FOIL means, you know, in the worst case, we end up with nine terms, which is not too bad. On the other hand, if you have three ones, then you, have, you, you potentially end up with 27 terms. So that's starting to get kind of tedious, unless you do a whole lot of simplification along the way quickly. So does that answer your question? I'm not sure whether you're asking, you know, which part is the answer. Okay. Any other questions about the exam? How about the last one? The number seven is not too difficult. Yeah. So I try to make this so that you know, if you make a mistake in one question or if you refuse to answer one question, it's not going to impact the other one. Because in question number seven, you can see you know, I gave you exactly the same starting point. So you don't have to solve you know, the one in question number six to get to number seven. And um, so if we end up with five terms. And you can also see how phi is really easy to negate to become its uh, CNF, because it is a negation of a CNF to begin with. And since you have to negate it again, you have a double negation. And then the CNF just goes like, oh, OK, it's already a CNF. Cool. That was intentional. <laughs> so that you don't have to use a lot of Boolean algebra to get to the CNF. So once you get to the CNF, it's just a matter of, you know, okay, um, how do I combine these things to get to the false, right? So you try to single out, you know, a particular letter, and you look at which one you know, seems to be the easiest to single out. Now this one is a little bit tricky, okay? If you just look at these two terms here, they are not resolvable. Because it might look like, okay, if it depends on whether people understand the resolution concept properly or not. To someone who did not end in the entirely understand the, the resolution term, these two already resolve to zero. But that is not true. Because if you can only resolve one variable at a time. And if you follow that step, you will find that if you resolve one variable at a time, you just end up with a true which means, um, but we're trying to target, we're trying to get to zero, you're not getting to a zero. So with this one, okay, let me see how I would single out you know, the terms. So 
All right, so we have a not P here, and okay, Q. Okay, so these two can single out the R. So now I just need to find out, find out, can I single out the not R? The answer is the not R is cannot be singled out. Okay, fine. We'll, sing, we'll try to single out something else. Try to use. Okay, we can single out the Q easily using this one and this one. So I get a Q. So next, I want to single out the not Q. So we got a not Q over here. We got another not Q over here. Okay, maybe that doesn't work out. Yeah, first one, first term. The first of each one, right? Single off the. Yeah, trying to figure, I'm trying to figure out which one to single out here is the easiest way to do it. Oh, I mixed it up in my head. Hmm? I mixed it up in my head. Oh, okay. So we can try to single out the P. So if I were to single out the P, the P is harder to single out because we only got one not P over here. To single out this not P, I need another thing that has a not R, that has an R in it. So I don't have anything else to do that. Okay. Stabis has to be R or Q. Okay, let me write it down and work this out because I want to work it out. So you could bring, I guess you bring the R over and then it's QQ, um, which just translates down to Q. Mm hmm Okay, so Let's do that. Q or not R. All right, so let's find out which two we can resolve. So go ahead. You, you had a suggestion earlier. So yeah, you can um, use the Q not R, um, you know, move the not R over to the other side. So we can use this one? Yeah, that not R. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can take it over to that. So um, Q plus R. Mm -hmm. And then no, not R and R cancel. That makes a one. So yeah, it cancels out. So these two would end up with a Q, right? Yeah. So we add the Q term here. So now we need to find the not Q. So how do we single out the not Q? So the not Q is not going to be. It would be. It would be on the P on the other side, or not P on the other side to cancel out the P, not Q. Say that again. Oh, I said we don't have a um, P on the right hand side to cancel right. out the. Yeah, but I know this one is resolvable. All of these are resolvable, so it's just a matter of, you know, figuring out. I think the Q is, do you think the Q is the ticket out, or do you think the R is the ticket out? It has to be the Q, because there's only one option for the not R, or the R to get resolved. Well, R has, a, R appears everywhere. I mean, okay, so let's, let's try out the R. So we'll try out, um, okay, so we're going to try this out again. Q, okay, so we have this one, and then we got this one. By doing these two, we resolve the R out. So now the question is, can we get the not R out? So we have not R with this one, and then we also have not R with this one. We can also try to resolve something that results in not R in a part of it. So that means you know we can look at this Q and find a not Q to resolve with it. Then we have P or not R. So, oh, okay, there we go, we can do that. So this is three, and this is also part of you know three. So with these two, we end up with P, or not R. And now we are almost done because now we can take this one, step four, and this is also step four, and now we end up with um, not R. So now we are all done because now we have five, 
I'm lining up. Ah, no, 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 no. Okay, I touched the uh, mouse button. So this is five, and this is also five, and now we have, we have a zero. So are we doing okay so far with the exam two review? Okay. But I did put like five you know, uh, of the relation questions at the, at the beginning. I think most people get the majority of the score of those five questions. I, I would certainly hope that is the case because I think those are relatively easier kind of questions. Um, so these are the two that are a little bit more challenging out of the seven, seven questions. Um, I would still give partial credit. If I can see people understanding the resolution concept, but may not be able to get all the way to the false, it will still get you know, like a good amount of partial credit. All right. Any other questions about exam two? No questions? All right. Then we're going to move back to what we should be talking about. We only have four weeks left after today. So that's not a, a whole lot of time. All right, so getting back to discrete probability. And I remember last time we talked about a few fun stuff like proof by induction and also the binomial theorem. So are there any questions about uh, proof by induction, which is a technique of proof? that can be useful in computer science, not only in this class, but also in many of your other classes. Are there any questions about proof by induction, the concept of proof by induction? Does anyone want another example of proof by induction? Okay, we got it. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at another example of proof by induction. All right. And what I can do is prove by induction. All right, so it's a lot of examples of proof by induction um, are recursive in nature. So we're going to go for you know, a recursive case in this case. So we'll go ahead and start with um, Okay, so we'll start with f of zero is defined to be zero. Okay, this is the uh, the end of the recursion. So now we have to define what if you know n is not zero. What if n is greater than zero? Then what is how do we define uh, f of n? So I have to think about this a little bit. <laughs> Give me a little bit of time. Um, okay. Okay, I think it's two times f of n minus one. Okay, let me work out the math first. So this is my, my cheating, yeah, because I kind of need to hide away the derivation, because otherwise you guys would go like, oh, we know the answer, it's not fun anymore. So let me see if okay. that will work. So it's f of n minus one. Um, Okay, there we go. All right, so I define these uh, uh, function f recursively like this. 
Okay? Now, if you work out like the first four numbers, like f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, and f of 4, you probably will figure out it's like, oh, okay, it is that, okay? But I'm not going to tell you what it is, okay? Well, actually, I have to because that's part of the theorem. Okay. So you can implement this function as it is and go like, okay, well, I'm not really sure what it does, but it's kind of funky. So what if I tell you this is my theorem? Okay, so theorem is f of n is actually n squared. Okay, that's the theorem. And for um, induction, I have to now say, you know, for all n, uh, for n being a natural number. Okay, so this applies to all natural number n. You go like, hmm, I don't really see how that can be the case. Well, let's find out, okay? It's entirely possible that I messed up the math too. So I'm double checking my math here. Hmm, probably did not mess up, so I think I can go with this now. Okay, so how do we prove this? So proof by induction has two distinct steps. Step one is the base case. So the base case means you want to prove the theorem is true for a specific value for n. Okay? So which one are you going to plug in? Do you have to plug in you know, using zero? The answer is no, you don't have to. You can just randomly pick a number. You can say, I'm going to choose f of 5. Okay? You can do that. And you would find if f of 5 is 25, and you would have proven the base case just all the same. The problem of not choosing 0 as your base case is now you need to do the induction step in both directions. You have to say, um, if I can prove f of n you know, follows the theorem, now I have to prove f of n plus 1 also follows the theorem. But on the other side, I also have to say, if f of n you know, follows the theorem, then f of n minus 1 will also have to follow the theorem. Can you do that? Yeah, sure, it's going to work. But why do you want to double the amount of work when you don't have to? Is that okay? Does everybody understand why I only want to choose 0 in this case? Because 0 is a natural end to the entire set of values that n can take on. Now, sometimes you cannot do this. Because sometimes you know, we will say, oh, this theorem applies to n, and all, and the n's can be any integer. So with integers, you cannot just say, oh, this is one end of all the integers. There's no such thing as one end of all the integers. Because it extends infinitely on both sides of the number line. So in that case, you kind of go like, OK, fine, we'll pick 0. But then we have to do the induction on the positive side. And then we have to do the induction on the negative side. But this time, uh, you know, since it's a natural number, it has a natural end to it. So I'm just going to choose the end. OK, so step, the base case is the theorem is uh, true for n equals to 0. Well, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll check it out. OK, so we'll say f of 0 is 0. And that's by definition. It is based on how we define f. OK, not a problem. And then we'll also say 0 times 0, which is 0 squared, is also 0. And now we have the end of the proof of the basis, or the base case. Are we OK so far? So the base case usually is pretty easy to work with. You just find a particular value, and then you just have to show, you know, if I plug in this value into n in the theorem, it's going to work out. That's it. So now we have to work on step two, which is the induction step. So the induction step starts with an assumption. The induction step always starts with assume the theorem is true for n equals to k. Meaning what? Meaning f of k is k squared. Ah, OK, I kept pressing the key in a strange way, and there we go. I think I got everything back. There we go. So f k squared here. OK. So the induction step always starts with an assumption that the theorem is right OK, for some k. All right? And you guys go like, but which k are we talking about? 
I can't tell you, okay? I'm just gonna say that for some K, we know this theorem is gonna work. So now we're gonna say, well, okay, fine, based on that assumption, what happens to when N equals to K plus one? So now we try to prove, try to prove the theorem for N equals to K plus one. All right, so what do we do? Well, we look at, okay, let's find out what is K plus one. So what do you think is K plus one? Which one, which rule do we use to expand F of something? The first line or the second line? Are we guaranteed to need one of these two lines when we are working with F of K plus one? And K is a natural number. Well, if K is a natural number, the smallest value K can take on is zero. Zero plus one, is not zero, so we have to use the second one. Does that make sense? So we have to use the recursive definition of f in this case. So the recursive definition simply says, okay, fine, whatever k plus 1 is, is the n. So now we have to look at the f of k plus 1, the whole thing minus 1, plus 2 of k plus 1, and then the whole thing minus 1. Is that part okay so far? And I think I might have make, made a mistake. We'll see. We'll find out. All right. So what do we do with whatever is inside the parentheses? You go like, uh, tech, doesn't that plus one and the minus one just kind of cancel themselves out? The answer is yes. Okay, that just becomes you know, f of k. And then we still have the plus 2k um, plus the 2 minus the 1, like so. And according to the assumption in the induction step, f of k is k squared. So f of k becomes k squared, and then we have the 2k over here, and then we have the plus 2 minus 1, uh, we just ended with a plus 1 over here. Is that okay? Does everybody see just you know, kind of using algebra and arithmetic, how I got to k squared plus 2k plus 1? Does that look familiar to you? Does that look like the third line of the Pascal's triangle? One, two, one. That means it is the same thing as k plus one squared. So that proves, you know, that finishes the proof of the induction step. So once we have the base case and we have the induction step itself proven, we're done. There's nothing else to do. Is that okay? Does that kind of help to illustrate, you know, how proof by induction works? All right. So why do you think this is a really useful technique to prove something, especially in computer science? Why do you think it applies specifically to computer science? I mean, one of your math professors, you know, may, be teach may have taught your calculus for eons, and only have used or have seen you know, proof by induction like once or twice. But in computer science, this is a really, really powerful technique to prove a theorem. Why is that the case? What kind of theorem do you think you'll be proving as a computer scientist? Whether or not an algorithm will actually terminate. Or whether it will get the right thing done, yes. right? Whether it will actually compute whatever you want it to compute. You, you claim that it computes. Okay, so why would Proof by induction be helpful? Because of how it relates to recursion. Exactly. But we hear from some professors that recursion is a bad thing because it chews up stack space like there's no tomorrow. <clears throat> and uh, generally speaking, you know, the non-recursive implementation of an algorithm is more efficient, it's faster. And on top of that, the expressive power of recursive um, programming and non-recursive programming is identical. Anything that is recursive, you can turn it into non-recursive and vice versa. So given that is the case, why are we still interested in recursion? Because it's easier to prove. Okay, and the way, the, the reason why recursion is easier to prove has to do with proof by induction. You have to find the base case. Under what condition do you stop the recursion? 
prove that is correct first, okay? And that usually is not hard, okay? Because the base case in recursion would be something that makes sense. It's like, yeah, we know that, that's simple, okay? But once you have that, okay, as the base case, then you just have to say, I, if I can make the assumption that the recursive call is going to do what it's supposed to do, how do I make sure that the caller of the recursive call is going to do the right thing as well? That is the power of proof by, induc uh, proof by induction, because it works well with recursion, and you can express anything recursively. If you can do it in a loop, you can do it recursively. So how many people are buying that statement? If you can do it in a loop, you can do it recursively. Okay? I, I, can, I can still give you one example. You know, I know it's a trivial example, but nonetheless, it is one of those things It's like, oh, okay. I did, you, know, may, you may not have thought of it that way. So let's look at string length, okay? So we have you know, unsigned uh, string length, and this is const char uh, pointer, pointer two by P, okay? So typically people use a loop and go like, okay, we're gonna keep counting up until we get to the null character, and then we just re return the count, and that will be the end of it. Well, if you do it recursively, you can now say return, and then we use a ternary operator, and then we ask, is P pointing to something that is null, okay? If it is not pointing to something that's null, that means whatever P is pointing to is a character. It's not a terminating character, but it is a character of the string. I take it as a one. Um, and then the rest of the string, well, whatever length it has, we'll just add it to it. Otherwise, if uh, whatever P is pointing to is null already, the length of this string is going to be zero. That's the recursive version of string length. So I recommend you doing it this way. No, because you know, this is going to kill the stack really, really quickly, um, because it needs one invocation per character of the string. If you have a long string, it's going to chew up a lot of space on your stack. All right? On the other hand, if you want to prove this algorithm is correct, it becomes really easy. It's almost trivial. Because in the base case is when the null character, when you're pointing at a null character already, uh, can I claim that string has a length of zero? Yeah, that's kind of easy to, to argue. But what if P is pointing to something that is not null? Well, then we look at the rest of the string, calculate the strength of that, length of that, and then just add one to it. Because that extra one has to do with whatever P is pointing to. Is that okay? So, um, this is just one example of why uh, proof by induction is super duper helpful in computer science. How many people think that this is going to be the last most math-like class you will ever take before you get your bachelor's, bachelor's degree in computer science? That's right, okay, not even close. <laughs> there will be a, at least two other classes that you have to take that are very math heavy. One is um, usually called the analysis of algorithms. So they would analyze whether algorithms would even terminate. And if they do terminate, do they get the right thing done? And if they terminate and gets the right thing done, how long is it going to take? Okay, we'll compute the time complexity in those classes. Um, they will also give you statements that are kind of like, are we really sure about that? For instance, no sorting algorithm can be faster than n log n. Okay, in a class like that, it will give you the proof that you cannot find an algorithm using a deterministic computer that can be faster than n log n when it comes to sorting. So that means quick sort, um, merge sort, um, and a few other you know sorting algorithms. They are as fast as it can be because those are n log n algorithms already. Another class that uses a lot of math is called, sometimes it's called the theory of computation. Um, other times it's called automata, you know, automata. Yes, automata. So that goes all the way back to Alan Turing, uh, who basically invented the entire model of how do we envision what computers can and cannot do. And that class is 
is very heavy in math, and a lot of the proofs also rely on some of the techniques that we talk about in this class. All right. So depending on your preferences, those classes can be fun. They, they can also be a little bit more challenging because it's not programming. It's not programming at all. It is all about math. All right. So at this point, we have already proven the binomial theorem. The binomial theorem states, um, this is the binomial theorem right there. So for any n as a natural number, p plus q to the power of n is the summation, the summation where index i goes from 0 to n, and in each term that, we are contributing, that contributes to the sum is n choose i times p to the power of i times q to the power of n minus i. That's it. But in this case, it gives us the flexibility of saying, what if we have a loaded coin? What if P and Q are not the same? Now, we know that one has to be one minus the other one because they have to add up to one. But if P and Q are not even, then we can actually do some interesting calculation. For instance, if P is representing the probability of transmitting a bit correctly, and Q is representing the chances of not transmitting a bit correctly, then we can do some analysis of how likely that you end up with this many bits that are not transmitted correctly in a packet. That can be very useful when you are dealing with networking equipment because now you can predict you know, how often you have to retransmit a particular packet. Is that okay so far? Making any sense? All right. <clears throat> so that's about the end of this entire module. Um, basically, this is the bottom line of the binomial distribution. Um, it's just, you know, if you have n things to begin with and you want to calculate what are the chances that m of them has, you know, is blah, and p is the, the opportunity of blah and q is the opportunity of not blah, you know, this is, this will give you the probability. All right. So I think, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So think about coin flipping. P is the chance of, of landing on the head. Q is the chance of, of landing on the tail. Is that okay? Yeah. So this gives you the probability of making N flips. M of them being heads and N minus M of them being tails. That's basically what it is. I see. It all depends on which one you want. Is the probability, the probability the same? Basically, like you, no, okay. no, matter, no matter what you want, the probability is going to be the same. Well, P and Q they have to add up to one, yeah. Because you only got two possible outcomes. P is the chances of getting one particular outcome. So naturally, Q, which is one minus P, has to be the chances of getting the other outcome. Uh, yeah. So it is limited to experiments where each trial only has two possible outcomes and you already know the probability of each outcome per trial. Yep. So coin, flipping a coin is you know, definitely one of the uh, easy to remember example for this one. Alrighty. So that's about it. I mean, this is the end, this is the end of um, probability and counting. So let's go back to the module and make sure that I did not miss anything important. Nope, those the uh, the other ones you know they are not. The I mean the really important ones are counting and discrete probability. This is a really short one. You know all it does is to say you know, what exactly is an event, and it's not even something that I wrote. This is from Wikipedia. Um, basically, an event is a is a set of outcomes that you're interested in. For instance, if you buy a lot of ticket, if you want to say, well, what are what are the chances that I my two bucks is not completely uh, gone? Okay, I got a price of some kind. I don't care which one it is. I just want a price. So now you have to add up all the um, possible possible cases where you end up with a certain price because you match something on your ticket. That becomes your event. Okay, because the you know, event is just a description 
of what we are interested in. So that's about it. I mean, that's basically what an event is. It's a set of outcomes of an experiment, which is a subset of the uh, possible outcomes, where the probability is assigned and it's of interest to us. Um, in the example of the birthday problem, the event is going to be the cases where, depending on which way you look at it, um, you can say the event would be the cases where we do not end up with two people having exactly the same birth date in the whole class. Okay, so all of those possible ways of arranging birth dates become the event. And then you have to look at the cardinality of the event and divide it by the cardinality of omega, which is all the possibilities of you know, um, how we can assign birth dates to different people in the class. All right, so we are now at the end of a particular segment in the class, and we can now choose how to proceed. So let me get back to the top of the modules. So we only got four weeks left, and I think we are still going to be okay. Um, we can talk about complexity, time complexity, which is the big O notation. There's not much I can ask you know, in, the, in these modules in terms of the final exam, but I will guarantee you that graphs would be an easy one for me to ask questions. And I think it is an interesting topic because if I understand correctly, Iraj also teaches um, Dijkstra's algorithm in his 430. Has he started to talk about that? No. No? Okay, I'm going to beat him to it. So I'll start on that one first this semester. <laughs> All right, so I think that's kind of settled. We can go with graph before we kind of touch on the other topics. All right, so now we are switching gear to talk about graphs. So graphs is an interesting topic because it actually has a lot of applications. Besides you know, finding the shortest route on the map and stuff like that, um, graph theory, which is a theoretical branch of mathematics, is very, very important in, a, in cryptography. So if anyone in this class is interested in the theoretical side of cryptography, and that's how you want to get into cybersecurity, you will need to understand what is graph theory. What we do here is not graph theory. This is like baby stuff in terms of you know, using graphs. But if you want to get into cryptography, you know, this, is like a very, this is a very gentle starting point to get into that stuff. So instead of talking about the notes here, I'll give you an example because I want to give you a context of why it is important to understand graphs and algorithms related to graphs. So let's just say that you are, okay, how do you call those people who go on field trips here you know, with like middle schoolers or elementary schoolers? just to make sure that everybody chaperone. behaves. Chaperone, that's it. So let's say you're a chaperone for um, like some your third graders to, the, to Six Flags, okay? So you have a whole bunch of kids with you. And you know, if you have ever been a chaperone, one thing you can count on is, where's the bathroom? I need to go now, okay? So that happens you know, when you're in Six Flags. So what do you do? Well, you flip over the map of the theme park, and you're trying to locate all the bathrooms. And guess what? You want to find the shortest route, because you don't want any accidents. Not on your watch, right? So we want to find the shortest route from where you are to one of the bathrooms. Do you want to pick a specific bathroom? Probably not, OK? Do you want to let the kids pick the bathroom and say, I really want to go to that one, just that one. I don't want to go to this one because it's next to the shark exhibit and I don't like that. No, you don't want the kids to pick. You, 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 you are the one picking it, right? Whatever is the closest is the one that you're, not gonna, you, you're going to go, right? Okay, so that's kind of the context. The way I describe um, this Dijkstra's algorithm, it doesn't give you a shortest route. It gives you all the shortest paths from any bathroom, from any point, which is a modified version of the, Dy of the Dijkstra's algorithm that Iraj will talk about. 
The reason why this one can find the shortest route from any point to any bathroom instead of from a particular point to a specific bathroom only has to do with, I start with, okay, let me try to remember. This one starts with the destinations and Irash's algorithm starts with the origin, where you start. That's the only difference. All right, so that's kind of the context of you know, why we want to work with graphs and certain algorithms you know, relating to graphs can be very important. Are there any questions at, at this point about graphs? Okay. What about playing chess? Because I know some of you go to the chess club and you play chess with other students. So do you think a game of chess can be seen as a graph? And if that is the case, what would be representing the nodes, or what would the nodes be representing? And what do you think the edges would be representing? Because when we think about the graph, we got these nodes, usually they're tiny little dots or small circles. And then we have these arrows, right, that we draw between the dots or the small arrow, the, the small circles. So if you are playing chess with somebody else, what do you think each node is going to represent? And what do you think each edge is going to represent? Each node is representing a board state. Okay? Specifically, exactly where all the pieces are. Okay? What, what about the edges? So now you have one configuration, you have another configuration, you have another configuration, and another configuration. So the edges are representing moves of the players. Is that okay? Now, this is an interesting graph because it's, it's called game theory. So in this particular case, you, know, you have two types of edges. One type of edges is representing moves by one player, and then the other set of edges would be representing moves by the other player. All right? So if, this is, if there's a graph representation, how would you exploit this graph to win or at least not to lose a game of chess? So this is not like you, this is not unlike you have a map, okay? And this is a map of a land where there are a lot of traps, okay? If you end up at one of those traps, you die. So you want to avoid being able to step in onto one of those traps or being forced to you know, fall into one of those traps. Kind of the same deal. So if you're at a certain place, a certain configuration, you want to explore what you can do. For everything that you can do from this configuration, it goes to a different configuration because your move changes the configuration of the board, which leads you to a different state. That state is a node. It's basically a thing, a junction in the graph. But at that junction, the other player can also make any move that is applicable you know, for that particular state, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see that this how, graph, how this graph has a high fan out ratio, especially at the beginning. Because you have to say, how many moves are possible, including all the stupid ones, right? Lots. So this is a very dense you know, graph with a high fan out ratio, but the idea is still the same. What move can I make so that I cannot be defeated if I explore any further from this branch? Is that, is that making any sense? Okay. So that's you know, one way of looking at um, how to use a graph and why it is applicable. I can give you another example, and this one is the one that I use in my, in my dissertation. So let's say you're a robot. Let's say you're a Roomba, okay? You're a Roomba robot, and uh, you have a map of every single floor that you're supposed to work on. And then somebody dropped you in an office building onto one of the floors without telling you which floor you're on. Are we doing okay so far? So you, you, you got powered up, you just wake up and go like, um, I think that person just forgot to let me know which floor I'm on. I got the maps for all the floors, but I don't know which floor I'm actually on. So, and you're running low on battery, but you know the charger station of every single floor. So now the question is, um, what do you do to get the best chance of recharging with, uh, before you run out of battery? That's the question. 
So what do you think is, uh, how do you think graphs apply in this case? <coughs> it's a very interesting application because it's fuzzy. Because you wake up, you map out whatever surrounding is immediately around you, right? Okay, I see a hallway on this side, a door over here, another door over here, and another hallway this way, you know, because I'm at the corner of the hallway, of two hallways. Okay. And then you look at all the maps, it's like, but there are six floors with exactly the same kind of corners, like what I'm here. You can be on any one of those six floors, six floors, right? So on one hand, you want to disambiguate where you are. At the same time, you want to optimize your uh, travel time to the closest charger. But that kind of depends on which floor you're on, and you don't know which one you, you're on. So to solve this problem, um, you are basically looking at what we're going to solve here as a graph problem, except the transitions are non-deterministic. In other words, there's a certain opportunity or chance associated with each transition. If you, if you attempt to make this move, there's a 30% chance you end up here, 20% chance you end up here, and a 50% chance you end up here. So things are stochastic instead of being deterministic. Stochastic means it is, uh, is probability-based and not uh, certain. So that turns out to be my dissertation. My, the, the title of my, dis, my dissertation was uh, Stochastic Admissible Heuristic Search. That's it, four words. And it was a really short dissertation. It was originally about 60 pages long. And we are talking about using 12-point font and double-spaced and also having wide margins. So 60 issue of pages is not a whole lot. I mean, that's, it, it's probably equivalent to maybe 20 pages of a textbook, OK? Um, because the entire thing was a mathematical proof of the property of the solution to a problem like that. So, so this is kind of a prob the kind of problem that I have a lot of personal interest in. Now, that was a long time ago. Okay, you know, I got my PhD in 90, 94 or 95. I cannot even remember. So that was a long time ago. But it was fun. Anyway, graphs. Okay, Google Maps, that's a lot of graph application, right? Because if, when you say, you know, I want to go from here to here, give me the shortest route. It's exactly using graph, you know, based algorithm. Is it using something simple like this? Probably not. Um, and I would think that you know, at some point, Google Maps will probably have to do load balancing. In other words, if it's getting like a lot of people, like let's say a thousand cars, trying to go from one point to another point, it's probably not a good idea to send everybody through the same route. Does that make sense? So now you want to, so Google has to kind of figure out, okay, how many people should I send on this route? How many people will send on this route? And how many people will send on this route here? So that everybody still end up you know, uh, getting the optimal time to get to the destination. So that's kind of a complicated problem to solve. All right, so what we'll do today is we're going to get used to some of the terms and probably not a whole lot more, maybe, maybe a little bit more. So a graph is a two-tuple. Remember how a propositional logic system is a five-tuple? This is a two-tuple, which means a graph is described by two different sets. The set V is a set of vertices. So in this class, when I say a vertex, a node, a state, they, are mean, they mean exactly the same thing. Okay, so these are the junctions. These are the places where you can branch out. And then E is a set of edges. So an edge is basically representing a way to go from one vertex to potentially another vertex. You can have an edge to go back to a vertex itself. You can have something that's quote unquote reflexive. Remember reflection? You can go back to yourself. So there's little restriction of the set of vertices. However, the nature of the set of edges depend on whether a graph is directed or not. <clears throat> in the case of a directed graph or a digraph in short, <clears throat> E has to be a subset of V Cartesian product with V. In other words, the way we represent each edge is a two-tuple. Where are you going from? Where are you going to? That's it, OK? Which vertex, are you, which vertex are you coming from? 
and which vertex are you going to? Each edge is representing a possibility to go from one edge, one vertex to another vertex. Is that okay? All right. So moving on to the next term. So the first item in the in the tuple is called the tail, and then the second item in the two tuple is called the head, which seems to be counterintuitive, but it makes sense if you think about it is the tail versus the head of an arrow. So the tail of an arrow is representing where you're coming from. The head of the arrow, which is the pointy side, is representing where you're going to. So if you look at it from that perspective, the tail head analogy is going to, is going to make more sense. All right, a graph can be undirected. Such a graph can be seen as a special case of a digraph, where AB is in E implies uh, if and only if BA is in E. Wait, tag. I think we have seen something like that before. In fact, it was on the exam the other day. What is this called if E was a relation defined over B as the set of vertices? <laughs> well, but we are not. We are over exam two already. We don't need to remember all that stuff anymore. What is this called? Symmetry. Symmetry. Exactly. So a digraph is basically just like a normal graph where E is, reflect, is symmetric over B. Is that okay? You can kind of see how the topics, you know, they kind of overlap a little bit. Okay, so that's kind of important. All right. So let me ask you this question. If you want to make a map, okay, for optimizing paths and travel time and so on and so forth, do you think that particular graph should be directed or do you think it should be undirected? Is direction important? Think about Six Flags and all the, and all the third graders with you. It should be directed. Because, okay, there are a few examples to illustrate why direction you know, matters. Think about San Francisco, downtown. All the one-way streets. Yep. Have you guys watched that a Mythbuster episode where they um, try to figure out whether right turns versus left turns, which one is more optimal in terms of fuel consumption? Do you guys watch that? Yes? Okay. So the conclusion was kind of interesting too. They found that for a normal passenger car, it doesn't make a difference. But for a truck, a delivery truck, it does make a difference. Whether you wait for the left turn or whether you go for right turns only. Yeah, I, uh, I drove for UPS during the pandemic. And uh -huh. there's like a whole crazy thing that like figures out an optimal route for <laughs> each day when you're hitting the road. And do, do, does it give you a lot of left turns or mostly right turns? Mostly right turns. Yeah. Because with left turns, especially in San Francisco, most of the time, you, you don't get a left turn signal, so you have to wait for all the on, oncoming traffic to clear before you can make a left turn. And what they found was with delivery trucks, idling takes up a lot of fuel. And that's why it makes a difference. With an electric car, with an EV, it hardly will sip any energy if you're not moving because it's just your AC and your fan running. So from the perspective of energy efficiency with an EV, it doesn't matter. You can wait at an intersection the whole day and you can camp out at the intersection. The, the energy consumed is, is negligible. But with a U, UPS truck, it's a different story because that diesel engine still consumes a significant, significant, significant amount of fuel when it's just idling. So that's kind of interesting because it, it still relates to what we are talking about here because now you have to make a differentiation between making a right turn versus a left turn. They do not have the same cost associated. And that's a big deal. Okay. Um, all right, getting back to here. In many graphs, so this is a good segue to talk about the distance function. So distance function looks like this as a function. Oh, we are talking about functions again. I wish we never have to deal with functions ever again. Now it is here. So with this notation, I hope you guys still remember what it means. D is a function, E is serving as the domain, and R star is serving as the codomain, which means we are looking at every element in the edge 
set, okay, each set, each each edge is associated with a non-negative real number. And that's your distance. You cannot have a negative distance because that would just kind of do a lot of funky stuff to you know algorithms, because now you can have loops, you can have you know stick click, you know, paths, and the more you travel on that path, the more negative the value goes, the better it is. In real life, we don't have stuff like that. Okay? So um, in most cases, the distance of an edge cannot be negative, hence the use of R star to denote non-negative real numbers. So that's just basically what I said earlier. We are running out of time today, and this is probably a good time to stop. But I would like you guys, because we do have a few days before Monday, is to read and try to understand Dijkstra's algorithm the way it is described here. You don't have to fully understand everything, but try your best to read the algorithm. And then on Monday, I will describe it first, and then we'll trace through an example in class. All right, have a nice weekend. And I think Friday is a holiday. There's no school on Friday. Not that it matters to us. It does matter to you. Right. Because the, there's uh, no design hub meeting. There isn't? Oh. Woohoo! I was going to uh, send you something. Yes. Uh, so I worked on the CSS for the front page. Uh -huh. And I didn't know exactly how to design it. So I made three different kind of like